Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to discuss something today with you about the cataract surgery, how we can maximize the outcomes of the surgery and creating more efficient service. But just before we start our discussion today, I would like to uh, share some questions uh, with you in the classroom. Uh, so uh, here we see the first slide and there's a question about how do we assess the competency of a good, or how we call it, a safe cataract surgeon. And I would like my colleagues in the classroom to share their opinion with me. So the consensus more to go with the number four in here on this. So for the second one, uh, we are speaking about risk stratification of cataract surgery. And then we have all of the above or none of the above. Do we have any preference? No? Some, we have some absolute th consensus on number five, all of the above. Excellent. Thank you. So we move to the next one now. Uh, the question is, what helps in improving the efficiency of service provided at cataract surgical units? So optimizing the service to make use of the available resources to perform more cases and reduce the overall cost while ensuring safety for patients. The last one before we start uh, discussing the topic for today is the immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery. And uh, I'm not sure if my colleagues are familiar with this term, but this is uh, uh, two cataract surgeries done exactly on the same day, on the same surgical session, one after the other. So it is immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery. Oh, excellent. So ISBCS is safer for patient than attending another visit for the second eye surgery. The risk of road traffic accident is higher than having a vision threatening complication. So essentially on your way to the hospital, the risk for getting a road traffic accident is higher than a complication in your second eye. Is that true or not? Any votes? People no? are saying yes, but they're hesitating. Okay, contraindicated when general anesthesia is needed. Votes? No. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, that's good. We are going now to start the discussion and as I mentioned, uh, the, um, before the, object, the objectives for this talk today is first discuss the current situation of cataract surgery, uh, including the uh, current situation and of course the demand that we have on the services now and the future trends. And also uh, we try to find some ways to increase efficiency of the cataract service provided in our units, well, wherever it is, here in the Middle East or in other places around the world. And then we can describe the risk stratification of cataract surgery, how it is important in improving the outcomes and the efficiency of the service. And finally, we will go through the immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery, its pros and cons of surgery, and then we uh, conclude the, the meeting for today. So um, uh, the same, the problem is still exists and uh, 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 some places in the world already managed to sort the problem to a big degree, like in India. But even here in the UK, you can see the statement on the screen now. Uh, so Professor McEwan saying, a perfect storm of increasing demand causing by more eye uh, disease and for an aging population requiring long-term care. So it is, the situation is, is actually uh, right now uh, is still existing anywhere in the world, whether it is uh, you can classify it or you call it developed or less developed. Uh, uh, if we look at the picture worldwide, uh, until now we have like 10 million and um, uh, uh, visually impaired and uh, 10 million blind and uh, 35 uh, million uh, blind, uh, uh, visually impaired due to the cataract. Of course, the blind, uh, the, uh, according to classification, is uh, the visual equity is less than 360 and the best corrected eye and the, uh, the visually impaired is between uh, 618 and 360. So the, the problem does exist and it will continue to exist. If anything, it might be getting even worse. So uh, there is cataract in the aging population. So where is actually the, uh, the uh, problem? Um, so the, the, uh, the current situation, more than third of the cases, um, in, even I'm speaking now about the UK, where I practice uh, now. Um, if we look at the picture, just to give you an idea that it is still existing, uh, more than a third of the cases with impairment less than 618 uh, in those over 75 years old. Um, 
they, uh, the statistics also show that the prevalence of the visually significant cataract with a vision less than 612, which is the kind of the legal vision for driving here in the UK, or operated cataract is about 35%, about uh, one third of people living above uh, aging are more than 65 years old. So it's quite a significant problem. Um, it will be surprising for you to know that at the time of the cataract surgery listing, uh, about 15% of patients are actually blind due to cataract here in the UK. So it is quite, again, quite proportion of the patient, about 15% are blind due to cataract. So it is existing and it's quite big. So uh, if we look at the prevalence, uh, prevalent in the, in the UK and the prevalence in the USA, it's quite significant as well as the disease, as you can see, 41 per 10,000 USA, it is 89 according to the, on the, on the uh, date mentioned here. Right now, the projection it is even more, uh, so it is uh, quite a significant and important problem. Uh, if we can look now at the graph on the screen, uh, the uh, this gives you the number of operations done over the last uh, 20 years, and at the same time, the uh, crude rate per thousand population. And uh, if anything, as we can see on the screen, the trend is increasing. And if you look at the number of surgeries here, uh, it is quite significant. It's about coming to 400,000 surgeries per year. Uh, so 400,000 surgeries per year is the most uh, uh, prevalent or the, the uh, most frequent surgery done, elective surgery done in the NHS, the National Health Service in the UK. So it is the biggest number of surgeries done. Uh, any kind of surgery, you are speaking about any kind of elective surgery anywhere in the body. It is the most frequent uh, surgery done. Um, so uh, now, the, how the future looks like, this is the current picture. Uh, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Um, uh, as we can see through the uh, table here, um, the number of uh, uh, population in the, in the UK uh, in million and according to their age group, uh, you can see through the next 20 years, it is coming to even uh, nearly doubling. If we look at the, uh, the uh, aging population above 80 years, it is uh, increasing up to 6 million uh, by the year 2035. So we have increase of around 50% in the number of cataract operation. 25% uh, of this increase will happen within the next 10 years. So uh, again, the problem is increasing and uh, it is not only the population increase, it is actually uh, the age group that we just discussed now. And the, we can see here the, the population uh, in thousand and we, uh, this increase is, is significant enough usually in the age group above 60. And that's where the problem uh, lies. So the, some studies done uh, using the available data to try to find an estimate of uh, what will be the problem like by year 20. Let's look at year 2020. So this is a low estimate using the, uh, the most strict criteria for listing cataract surgery. We have up to 700,000 people waiting for surgery by year 2020. Uh, sorry. So, and the higher estimate, uh, which uses actually the patient dissatisfaction. So any type of cataract, patient describing, I'm not satisfied with my vision now, we have uh, the estimate will be up to 2 million people or 2.5 million people uh, would like to have cataract surgery by year 2020, which is, again, maybe five times what we have right now. So now we, we can define the problem. Uh, as simple, uh, the simple uh, uh, problem that we have, we have more people, they live longer, we have bigger demand, and uh, to uh, the bad side that we actually, if anything, we have less ophthalmologists worldwide. Uh, we are not actually educating enough ophthalmologists. And despite the fact that 50% increase in the number of cataracts in 20 years, the education for England uh, found that the number of consultants will only increase by 10%. So they will, we will never be able to match the uh, need uh, even here in the UK, I'm sure the problem is even worse in other parts of the world, especially in places like in Africa, where we worked before. It will be the same in, in other places like in China. And I'm sure the problem will continue to be uh, the same in other places in the world, like in the Middle East, where we, the, the Flying Hospital is now on the, in Doha and 
in other countries around the region. So uh, this is the problem. And as, as a surgeon or as a con an ophthalmologist, as we are all now, uh, what can we do to help? I usually keep asking myself this question because uh, we, we don't have many or much to do, actually. The problem is, as a surgeon, you sometimes feel helpless because uh, you are working within a healthcare system. Uh, it is usually run by managers. It is hardly run by the clinical uh, people like us. Uh, uh, the, the, the problems around you is more to do with the creating the surgical flow within the, unit, within, the, within the unit where you are working. So there is actually a little to do as a surgeon, but we still, if we go backward, and that's what I encounter every day, we still can do something. And a, a simple equation is to try to increase the efficiency of the service provided. Uh, we can do it better uh, as a simple logic. We can do whatever we do better, or we can increase the outputs if we can. So. Uh, this is, uh, if we manage to do the two or one of them, at least we uh, did what we can and we can help in improving the outputs of the service that we uh, deliver. Uh, so again, I would like to get my audience to share some questions with me. Uh, we, the first slide we asked, what, how we define a good or a competent cataract surgeon. This is a cornerstone for the service. And if we are going to improve the service or increase the output, we have to make sure that we have a good, competent cataract surgeon. As I mentioned also at the beginning, we, in any ophthalmic meeting or any meeting we go, the big part of the meeting is towards the cataract surgery, its complication, the new techniques developed, and it is really exhausted. And I, I am quite sure that um, uh, most of my colleagues are sitting in the classroom sharing this with me, that uh, we know that in this case, you will do uh, such uh, um, adjustment to your technique, you will take extra precaution, and this was discussed over and over and over. If you go to the American Academy meeting, the cataract Monday, uh, it, it is a kind of uh, a repetition with variable presentations of what's happening in the cataract surgery, and we are not adding much. We are just learning more. Of course, this is important, but we are not adding much. So uh, this was the question here about how we can define a, a good cataract surgeon. Is it by comparing the cataract surgeon to his colleague working with him isn't this within the same unit? Is it by crude statistics, his cataract, uh, his surgical complication rate is less than 5%? Is that true? Is it only by his visual function outcome? Or it is by looking at the overall uh, 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 cases that he done over a year and look at the case mix because it is not fair if, if you are a consultant in a hospital and you get a referral of the most complex cases and your staff colleague who is actually doing the average cases and he gets 95% and you get 80% success rate, this means that you are uh, in, in a different position. Actually, this will be uh, worse for uh, keeping your motivation and success. So the definition is simple. You need to audit your cases, yes. This is really important but taking into account the mix of cases you are doing and the degree of difficulty of cases you are doing. So when you present your statistics at the end, it is uh, adjusted against the risk factors you dealt with. If, for example, if I'm dealing with a patient with a risk of a complication up to 35%, and this accounts for about 10% of my practice, and I ended up with a higher complication rates than my colleagues, then I'm still in a better position Actually, I should get more referrals to keep my practice to the standard. So this is really important uh, concept to understand. And uh, we have to uh, focus on this in any surgical unit. Yes, it is important to audit your cases. Yes, it is important to look at your complication rate. But it is not complication rate from uh, uh, the same unit for the same grades for everybody. It is not the case. It is your own surgical audit with the uh, adjustment of the risk factors that take, taken into the account. And with that, what we call the case mix. What is your cases like? How many pseudo-exfoliation patients you had? How many uh, post-vitrectomy patients? How many small pupils? All this comes into the uh, equation. Uh, if also I ask my colleagues in the classroom, what case do you remember most out of your last week, call it a month or a year, cataract surgeries? So if I ask my colleague in the classroom, which case do you remember most now? 
Will you remember the case that was, went successfully or will you remember the case where you encountered the complication? You will usually remember the case that you encountered the complication in. It will never go away. So we usually focus on the complication, but the overall picture is not that way. We actually, our uh, mind tends to go to the worst scenario and that's a this is the nature. So we keep remembering the complication, but it doesn't take into the overall efficiency of the service. And this is really important to understand as well. Now, the other question is, when you see a cataract patient coming to your clinic, do you counsel him? Uh, do you tell your patient that you have a complication rate up to 5%? Uh, there is a risk of one in a thousand loss of vision. How do you counsel your patient? This is really important. And setting your expectations at exactly the right place. Um, I saw it uh, over and over where uh, pe people actually booked directly into the system. They try different approaches. They try to increase the surgical flow by just getting the patient into the system directly through the optician. But then the complication happened and you go retrospectively and say, oh, they had this kind of risk factors. This is too late now to counsel your patient. It is already done. So counseling the patient before the surgery is really important. How are we going to cancel the patient if we don't understand risks associated with the surgery? This is really important as well. Now, the other thing is with the more advanced hap advancements happening in cataract surgery, do you consider cataract surgery as a minor surgery? Does it compare to a tooth extraction, for example? Some people refer to the pain when even when I finish the surgery and I look at them, oh, they say, oh, this was even similar to a tooth extraction. Is that true? Yes, it is true somehow because it is getting more and more uh, uh, technically uh, uh, controlled. Uh, it is more successful. We do it more, but it is not a tooth extraction. I remember usually one of my uh, mentors when I started training, uh, when the patient usually tell them, uh, oh, it took very short time. Uh, this, how you are going, to, he was doing it privately. How you are going to charge me this much money for this? He was saying, looking at them smiling, I can make it last. And this is true. I can make it last and you will be the loser. So he is efficient because he is, he is actually, he is well trained. He knows what he's doing, but we can make it last. So it's not a tooth extraction by any means. Uh, then uh, the last question before we go to this uh, risk stratification, um, did you have surgeries canceled recently in your dental classroom? And what was the reason for the cancellation? when you canceled your last cataract patient on the day or the day before, what was the reason for you to cancel the surgery? Do we remember what was the reason for canceling our surgeries, what we encounter all the time? That's also something important. So here we can look at one uh, uh, short study uh, done by Fernando uh, here in the UK in 2008. He looked at the reasons for cancellation on the surgical day. So if you look at the number, this is something significant. They reported 402 patients canceled out of 2,000. So it's about 25% of cases canceled. This is quite a significant number. Of course, this is not a representation of what is happening in the country, but we encounter this every day. Myself, I actually do see it every day. 60% uh, of this cancellation was fake or emulsification. Of course, again, because the proportion of the cataract surgery we do is more than any other surgery we do in any surgical unit. And if we, he looked at the causes for cancellation, and um, some of them, of course, it is out of your hand as a unit, the patient failed to attend, whether he didn't get the appointment card, the appointment card is delayed at the post, or something happened, the patient didn't attend, or on the day, the patient not being suitable for local anesthesia. So, and this was a quite significant number. It is 15, nearly 15% 15 of the cases. They were not suitable for the type of anesthesia. You are doing it on the day. And this is quite serious because you reach to the time now, you have a space allocated for you. They are expecting you to deliver six cataract. The service is in a big demand and you are expected to do the surgery and you cancel a case, not because of any uh, a reason outside your hand, it is just because you fail to counsel, the, to assist the patient before the surgery, whether he is suitable for local anesthesia or not. Then we have patient counseling on the day of the surgery for different reasons. They have cold, they have, uh, they have flu, they have uh, inflammation, they have infection, something like this. Um, and the last one is a, a, a poor control of pre-existing medical condition. And this is also another significant problem we encounter all the time as surgeons. 
uh, it is about 10% of the cases cancelled. But this was the picture in one unit in the UK. How about the national audit of 313 day surgical unit? They found that up to 45% of the theater time allocated for surgery not being used because of the cancellation. So we can imagine now in, in, in the presence of all the demand that we discussed and all the shortage that we, uh, we, we have all the time of the uh, trained personnel to do surgeries, we have up to nearly coming to 50% of the time that is allocated for us, it is not used. And um, this is again, uh, quite serious. So as a simple equation again, number equals money. When it comes to cataract surgery anywhere in the world, cataract number equals money. So the more we do, the more profit per case we get. It is a simple equation. So for example, here, if you look at the table in front of us, if we have that this is the number of cataracts per list, five, six, seven, eight. And as we go down, the, the profit for ca per case is significantly increasing, if not doubling. So if I'm doing, um, if I'm doing w as five cases for the same surgical session, which is a four hours, uh, and I ended up doing eight, I increased the profit per case to the trust where I'm working or to the hospital where I'm working from just 160 pounds to 347 pounds. Uh, 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 profit. So it is doubling the, 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 the money that we can get by just adding two cases. So a quite significant uh, number. So number equals money. We need to do more and we have to uh, make the, the, the places where we work uh, achieve more by uh, making the profit. So uh, the concept of risk stratification is not new and uh, the risk stratification is done in other uh, uh, places in other even uh, uh, industries, it is not only for medicine, but for, for medicine risk stratification, the concept when it was introduced uh, was a really uh, a good concept, especially for the cataract surgeon. So as definition, risk stratification, as we can see here on the screen, risk stratified patient is to sort them into high, moderate, and low risk health tiers. And risk stratification can help you align the practice very limited time and resources to make priority to the need of its patient population. So we can allocate the time that we have to the difficulty that we have. This is really important concept. And we cannot do this on the day of the surgery. We cannot do it on the spot where we see the patient before the surgery. It has to be done before we go to the day of the surgery. This is really important. So uh, two big studies done, and I think this is one of the most important cataract studies done worldwide. This is a cataract surgical audit of 55,000 patients done over five years in the UK and they were just auditing the, uh, the, the number using electronic medical record and the, uh, the, they were looking at uh, different risk uh, factors and how it, uh, it, uh, you can calculate the risk factor based on what you, we encounter every day. Of course they used the data in different analysis. We are, in this paper here, we are just looking at the posterior capsule rupture rate, which is our preferred standard as cataract surgeon, are we successful or not, and the vitreous loss. <clears throat> uh, I know that this uh, table is, looks like a small print on the screen. Uh, I'm not going into detail into this, but what they did, they looked at uh, risk factors associated with the surgery, they try to develop the odds, odd ratios for having complication. And on each of this, they studied each individually and they were looking at the odds of having complications. So we have age here, as we increase in age, you, a patient above 90 has 2.37 odds of increase, odd ratio of having complication during the cataract surgery. And female, male, um, it looks like males are encountering more complications. This is my personal experience as well. I'm not sure if that's the same with you. I'm not sure why but males are more prone to have complications. They are very nervous during the surgery. They keep squeezing. Sometimes they have high brow, deep set eyes. They have a mix of other problems happening with them. Um, uh, 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 glaucoma, uh, does it increase? Yes, it is 1.3. So they looked at everything. I'm not going into detail here. It just gives you an idea. So for example, if we look at, sorry. So if we look at the pseudo exfoliation at the table here, it is 2.92. Uh, increase in odd ratios of having complication during the cataract surgery. 
to three-fold increase in the, number, in the possibility. But this is not the uh, increased probability. Uh, it, this is a graph here. So the, essentially what they did is to use the odd ratios. And it's not, if you, for example, if you have, uh, this is an example here. Uh, we have a male patient. Uh, he's aged 8 to 80 to 89. He has a white cataract. There is no fundal view, a small pupil, a specialist registrar. A specialist registrar is a trainee here. He is doing the cataract surgery in this patient. So what is the risk of this patient to go into posterior capsule rate or visual loss or vitreous loss? Can I tell the patient a number before the surgery? Can I counsel him and tell him that your risk of going into complication compared to anybody else is something, a certain figure? Yes, we can using this uh, uh, data. Uh, and the odd ratio is not like one plus two, it is one multiplied by two. So if we have an odd ratio of 1.28, 1.5, we multiply all the odd ratios, we get a certain number. And then if we go back here, the, if we get odd ratios, composite odd ratios of 34, this will uh, be actually corresponding with about increased probability of 20% of uh, posterior capsular rupture or vitreous loss during the cataract surgery. So we have 34 uh, um, composite odd ratios, and this is a graph here. Theoretically, if you have all the, all the um, uh, risk factors, it can be up to 80%. Did you encounter a patient where all the risk factors happen? I encountered some where you can have nearly the, 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 the maximum risk factors, but it can never be uh, all what they listed here in this, in this table. So more or less, we are running maybe a risk of 50% as a maximum. Um, this is another example. But this example here is just to give you an example of that. If the same patient with all these risk factors, the risk if operated by a consultant who is the most trained person or the most senior uh, person in the unit compared to a senior uh, house officer with a, a junior registrar or a junior trainee, the risk increased from 21% to 50%. It is the same risk factors. We didn't change anything. It's just the grade of the operating surgeon. Now, the complex or the cataract patient is, is difficult to define. But as again, as a, a group of practitioners, we agreed on certain number of risk factors that we encounter all the time. Uh, this was a, a table here showing what kind of complex cataract surgeries we have or the patients was a problem that we encounter. And I'm not going through them, but you can see, of course, the corneal problem, including the Fuchs dystrophy, corneal scars, uh, the lens itself is small, uh, subluxated, small pupils, uh, short axial lens, high axial lens, previous iritis. All this makes the cataract a bit more challenging. This is the second, I think, very important paper to when we look at risk stratification. And uh, uh, it is actually uh, looking at the uh, system to try to stratify a cataract patient. Uh, this was done by Muhtasib here in the UK. And as you can see, it was published in, published in the British Journal uh, in 2004. And the, by the way, it was validated again in India. There was a study in India validated this result. So it is, a valid, it is valid in different regions around the world. So it is not uh, unique to the UK. It, this system worked in other places around the world. Uh, now, Muhtasib was looking for an actual system that he can give you, you can use, and it is very efficient in stratify, stratifying your cases before the day of the surgery. What he did is he divided the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the patient, he divided his patient into uh, three, group, uh, four, uh, three groups, I'm sorry. So group one, is a group with no added risk. He didn't have, the patient this group didn't have any risk. They, zero point, I give them zero point. And the category B, which he considered um, low risk, uh, one to two points in this uh, uh, table here. And the category C, uh, three points each. And you can see as we uh, move here, the, the more we move here, that's dense, so the explanation, so the cases becomes more difficult. And he assigned three points for each of them. And this was his results. So he looked at the number of complication and this is clear trend of increasing complication as we increase in difficulty in groups. So as we move here in the rescue groups, it is actually getting worse. So, it's, um, uh, so 
he had four groups, I'm sorry, but he used three groups to, uh, um, uh, to quantify the risk. So he ended up with this clear graph. As we go through the difficulty, complications increase. It doesn't need um, a lot to, uh, to see. It, is, it, was, it, it was clear from the data. And again, the overall complication rate increased from just 4.32, which we usually use as uh, classifying our risk for average cataract surgery. We usually counsel patient and say, your risk of running into posterior capsular rupture. I saw some of the people agreed on this number at the beginning of the, uh, of the when we had the question, that we usually say 5%, up to 32%. So uh, again, significant increase. If you have a patient with phacodonesis, pseudo-exfoliation, you can run up to a risk up to 32%. Now, this is another, uh, 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 another way of using the risk stratification and this uh, uh, risk stratification system is uh, um, advocated by the uh, cataract uh, forward uh, uh, project done recently by the Royal College of Ophthalmologists um, so in uh, 2016. And they didn't use the three groups of muhtasib. They just assigned a score for each of the risk factors of the comorbidities. And then you calculate your risk, add the numbers together. And then if the number falls below three, you give the surgery to a specialist registrar, a trainee. If the number is between three and six, you give it to a fellow who is slightly more trained. And if it is above six, you give it to the consultant. The difficult cases that we encounter, uh, maybe we can discuss this together now. So let, let's say deep set eye, high brow. What will be our preferred uh, technique for this patient? What different we, what, what is the difference that we do during the surgery? Now, we saw the patient before the surgery on your, on your uh, one-stop cataract surgery clinic, and you already met the patient, so, and you, you knew now that he has a deep set eye. What, will, what difference we will do? Any suggestions from the audience? Uh, what I suggest is doing a temporary approach and probably a local anesthetic with maybe a little bit more amount of uh, uh, injection just to float the eye within the globe. Absolutely, excellent. Of course, that's 100% uh, true. So if you have a deep set eye now, if you are not comfortable working uh, from the temporal side, uh, okay, that's fine. You can find one of your colleagues within the same unit who pre works temporarily. And this is definitely will make the case much easier, as Dr. Rashdan already mentioned. And or you're using uh, subtenin or retropulbar anesthesia will lift the globe up. Actually, yesterday I had a case uh, which was uh, referred after having a complication. And even after giving the general anesthesia, because the patient was very nervous, we used subtenin in a patient who was completely asleep. So that's absolutely right. We did the same. And this, let's say, for, for fuchs cornea dystrophy. What difference we will adjust during the surgery? We knew that he has fixed this now. True. So we, we will use different technique, the soft shell technique, as we call it. So dispersive and cohesive with the, the, dual, uh, the, the dual technique. So we inject the dispersive and we make sure it coats the inner part of the eye. And then we go with the cohesive to form the front of the eye. And of course, again here, uh, as, uh, as you mentioned, we have to be gentle, but gentle... Uh, I think the word may be better than gentle. You have to be comfortable with your technique. So whatever you do, for example, some of my colleagues usually say it's better for someone who does, who does shopping uh, or divide and conquer. I personally believe in whatever you are comfortable with, you, if you are mastering your technique, it will not make any difference. This is my personal experience. Whether you are doing shopping or whether you are doing the divide and conquer, it's just that you know what you're doing and you do it right. That's all. Uh, a corneal scar patient, what we will do different about him? Do you use vision blue in these cases or? Yeah, it's, it's, it's true, but uh, a corneal scar usually is more when you sit on the table. Actually, if you sit in the, in the clinic, it, uh, you, know, you say, oh, this is a post-herpetic cataract. Ah, it is a faint scar. But once you are on the surgical table, the scattering of the light from the surgical microscope can make your life as a nightmare because you cannot see you are and during the surgery. So it is quite a challenging one. So we have, as you mentioned, the elimination is important, but sometimes also increasing elimination makes more scatter. Uh, there is use of fiber optics through the clear part and we switch the light off this. A bit more advanced techniques or using some stains also might be helpful. Um, 
a small pupil. What can we do for a patient with a small pupil? We can so, use iris hooks. Exactly, iris hooks, uh, malugan ring, whatever you are comfortable with. So uh, this is something important. A pseudo exfoliation patient. We just pray. <laughs> It will go without any complication, but in pseudo exfoliation patients, it actually it is a mix of all what we are discussing here. It is a uh, it is a, the lens is loose, the pupil is small, and the cataract is dense. So it is a very challenging case. So we have to again be very careful. All the age is a significant risk factor, by the way. So I I have seen this. I've seen patients above ninety. And usually, uh, when you see a trainee looking at the case, say, oh, this is a straightforward case. I would like to go and do it. The second thing happens usually, you find them coming, say, this case is complicated. It is true. Just increasing age is a risk factor in its own. And we have to look at this very carefully because uh, this patient's, uh, 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 the, the tissues of the eye becomes, for a reason, more friable. The, t the, the iris becomes floppy. And every time you get into the eye, you find the iris coming, and this is really challenging. So in old age, it is a risk factor, and it is quite significant risk factor, which is usually not looked at as it should be. In addition to the old age, sometimes you get uh, kyphos, scoliosis, and COPD, and all these things. And I had to do some cataracts standing up, because the patient yes. do not, you know, can't stay fat. So I had the fun of doing these uh, in the Absolutely. last three four years. And the, uh, as you mentioned, the, 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 with the old age, uh, especially if you have a man as well, so the male, the male old age will be a bit more challenging as well. So for, for a reason, as we mentioned, uh, just being a male increases your risk. Uh, shallow anterior chamber, I consider this the uh, most uh, risk factor for a trainee. So if you have a trainee, the last thing is to offer them is a shallow AC. This is usually the most challenging a uh, uh, risk factor for someone who's starting. There is no space for moving in the eye. You have to go in and come out very quickly without causing complication. You have to construct your wound in a way that not to uh, get iris coming through uh, a, long, a, a little bit longer tunnel than what you usually do in the cornea, uh, forming the tube chamber using different viscoelastic uh, like helium GV or something. So this is a bit, uh, this is actually from what I've seen, uh, the most difficulty that uh, trainees encounter. And the last, of course, is the posterior polar cataract, which can increase your risk up to 30, increase the risk up to 35% sometime if the posterior capsule is open. But luckily, most of these cases are usually softish. So there is a compromise that you must be able to do the vitrectomy. Now, after looking at all these cases, it looks like that we all, as, as, as ophthalmologists, know what we need to do in difficult cases. Now, the job for us is to know before the surgery that we have the difficult cases. And uh, as Dia mentioned, he managed to go through the difficulties, but he was ahead of the surgery, ahead of the day of the surgery. He knows that he is going to operate on this guy tomorrow or this patient tomorrow. This is important. He was prepared mentally. He was actually listed to be done by him because he's the most senior surgeon, or at least he knows what he is doing according to his grade of training, if it happened in the past. So this is really important. We won't do this on the day of the surgery. If we know this ahead of the surgery, we minimize the risk, we minimize the complication, we made more efficient use of the time, we are not canceling patients. So that's what I'm trying to say here. One of the things that we didn't discuss here, uh, all of us right now, when we looked at all these cases, none of us said, ah, I have to look for the grade of surgeon that knows how to deal with these cases, refer the case, if you don't know how to deal with it, it's not, it's not bad. This is actually a good practice. This patient is beyond my abilities to do, and I prefer to refer him to my colleague. He's more experienced doing it. Now, I did two things at the same time. I stratified the risk. I saved myself a complication, and I made more efficient use of the service that we have. So the time allocated to me is not wasted by just trying to do something and we cancel the case or we postpone two cases, which I can do. This is really important. Okay, so right now, this is the risk as we discussed, and they made electronic medical records and it is available any, uh, uh, around the world now. Um, I'm not sure if you use electronic medical record or not, or you have it available at your unit, but it is more commonly used. Um, 
the electronic medical record gives you the option to record the associated risk factors and actually it calculates the risk for you so it is it is uh, integrated into the system this was an interesting uh, paper here what they did they went back in norwich here in the uk in a unit in norwich and they did an audit in the unit actually this unit is quite advanced cataract unit and they were sharing in the national audit for the cataract they have the electronic medical record and among the team they run an anonymous uh, audit for the pay, for the surgeons asking them do you report your risk factors interestingly we look at this this is the unit i told you advanced they found that the uh, patient the surgeon are actually not reporting the risk factors and some of them reported a significant proportion not reporting everything and some of them they just reported when complication happened this is again a human nature we 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 tend to look at the picture when the problem uh, happens and this is the, the the worst part we have to plan ahead a plan ahead of your game then you can minimize the risk we will now look at the another concept which is called immediate sequential bilateral cataract surgery two surgeries two cataract surgeries done exactly at the same time on the same surgical session this concept is not new actually it goes back to 1952 1952 it was done even with intracapsular cataract surgery they did two surgeries exactly in the same setting in the same place now it is becoming more and more common with the FACO introduction but it is also done in some places in india with them the manually small incision cataract surgery they do both cataract at the same time finland is a leading country on this um, 40 to 60 percent of their practice is done as immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery in uh, some regions in spain for example canary island they do 80 percent of cases as and the government is actually supporting this in ontario canada they are increasing now as we can see it is increased from 1.02 percent to nearly 2.3 taking into account that the actual number of cataract surgeries increase this is a significant increase on the number of patients who had the immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery. Uh, Australia is the same. They are encouraging this. But interestingly enough, in, in America, in the USA, if you do it, you will be penalized by the uh, insurance companies. I'm not sure about why, but there must be a good reason for them to penalize them if you decide to go ahead and do it. In Israel and in Japan, if you do it, it is at your own expense. We are not paying you do it so it is good for you from the patient so we can still see some variance in practice around the world but definitely there are places where increasing use of this uh, service um, what do you think about the uh, if i tell any uh, patient if i tell even my colleagues whether they are medical or uh, ophthalmologist i'm going to do two cataracts at the same time what will be the first thing comes to your mind what scares you most of this? What makes you comfortable about it? What do you think? To see the response of the patient to the initial uh, cataract surgery may be good. Uh, any com any postoperative complication? Absolutely. See what happens. So you don't have the option to see what will be the response for the first cataract surgery. You don't have time to assess your outcome to plan for the other eye. That's excellent. That's really good. What else comes to your mind? Is it if I tell you as a patient now, I'm going to do you both your cataracts on the same setting, will you say yes or no? And why? Why you say no or why you say yes? What makes you scared? Personally, I would say no, to be honest. Uh, the, yes. the biggest fear is infection, regardless of all of the precautions, scrubbing again, different set, different batches and so on. I would be worried about infection most, personally. Fair enough. Yes, actually, also the post-op uh, recovery. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, it. Uh, both eyes, the vision is blurred and uh, red, and you will cover one eye. So I'm not sure why. I mean, I understand. It's. Uh, it's not comfortable to do both eyes in one time for me. Or... Okay, fair enough. Again, this is a very good concern. So that's exactly what was discussed, as we can see now. That's the, uh, the debate that's happening in many parts of the world, whether we will end up with doing more or less, that's usually happening. So 
now there is an actually a, a, a society international society for bilateral cataract surgery and you can see the uh, their web address here this is a, a society and it has members around the world of course it is mainly in europe now but it might be gaining more popularity around the world as well so this society uh, develop a very very thorough protocol if you would like to practice your uh, immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery and I don't like these big slides, but I just put it to you as look at here. Three slides just summarizes some of the guidelines uh, of this precautions taken if you would like to consider doing bilateral cataract surgery. Uh, of course, if we be going to do cataract surgery in both eyes, it has to be indicated. So there must be a reason to do cataract surgery. Um, any concomitant ocular or periocular disease should be managed. So if you have any other problem in the eye, it should be managed before you go ahead and you do the cataract surgery. Now, it's a very important concept that we discussed, the risk stratification. So the complexity of the cataract surgery should be within your ability to do, your competence to do. And uh, as a default, challenging cases is excluded from the immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery. You cannot do a, a case where all what we discussed about the risks associated as bilateral cataract surgery. So now, as we go down, you will notice that we are minimizing the number. We'll be going to immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery. Patients should be consented, of course. He must be free to completely choose between your two approaches. In your unit, you are running a high volume, immediate sequential bilateral cataract surgery, or delayed sequential bilateral cataract surgery when you do one eye and patient comes back in four, uh, four weeks and do the other eye. Uh, there is one thing uh, one of our colleagues in the classroom said now, which is the risk right-left errors. Um, uh, they, it's not the right risk error that you mentioned. I'm sorry, you mentioned about the post-operative uh, uh, outcome. But right-left error should be minimized, of course. You are doing both eyes. You might implant the lens of the right eye in the left or the opposite, or you, do, you use the measurement in a different eye, or you plan your astigmatism axis in a different way. So it's a bit confusing. But they, of course, they have the WHO checklist and the, the board, and this minimize this complication to happen. Does it still happen in the everyday cataract surgery? Yes, and we call it never event. But uh, will it happen in this? Yes, we can. it can happen, but we are trying to minimize it to the minimum by just following the guidelines. Um, uh, we uh, minimizing the power lens uh, errors, the lens power errors by having uh, someone who is familiar with uh, choosing your lens and making sure it is ready. Of course, it is your responsibility as a surgeon to check the lens before the surgery and to make sure that you are implanting the right power, but it falls entirely at your responsibility. And this is something you can be trained to do it efficiently in a very short time without, with the minimum error. Again, it is a never event. Now, the most important part, which is usually comes to our mind, is the infection, as Rush, uh, the, uh, mentioned now. Uh, we are scared about the infection, and we are scared about infection happening in both eyes at the same time on the same day. This is really a serious concern. Um, this is the part here in this slide. We are looking at why, what we can do to minimize this risk to the minimum, if nearly negligible. So they there shouldn't be nothing in, the, in physical contact with the first eye surgery should be used for the second eye. You cannot use anything that you used in the first eye with the second eye. Um, uh, they are also mentioned separate instrument trays. We use two different trays. There shouldn't be any crossover instruments or drugs or devices between the two eyes. We use different uh, uh, viscoelastics, even if we use two different companies, completely different. We try to even the, uh, the, the uh, manufacturer, uh, if it is not the same, and the gloves, even the gloves, if you can use two different types this way, not, the same, not from the same batch number. Uh, they recommend that nothing must be changed due to the supplier in respect to the supplier. Uh, uh, the, everything it should be acceptable before proceeding to the second eye. And of course, we need to re-scrub, re-glove, and everything could, should, should be changed. Uh, intracameral antibiotics made a huge difference after it was introduced. 
and minimizing the risk of endophthalmitis, any cataract. But if we look at this now, this will be even minimizing it further down. So that after introduction of the intracameral antibiotics, this was even making the surgeon more comfortable doing the, uh, the uh, immediate sequential bilateral cataract surgery. Now, you are in the middle of the cataract surgery and you had a complication in the first eye. You will not proceed with the second eye. So, for example, if you have a complicated cataract, or you are planning to do two eyes, and you have done the first eye, and you are moving to the second, you stop, you postpone, and you look at this case later, and you do the second eye. The eye, uh, the immediate sequential bilateral cataract surgery should not be patched. This answers the question of for the, my colleague in the classroom. We are not patching our uh, cataract surgeons, cataract patients anymore. Maybe the cataract surgeon. We are not patching them anymore. We are actually leaving them with a clear plastic shield so they can see through it. And uh, that's actually the recommended protocol for the cataract now, the, the delayed sequential cataract. So it was also applicable for the immediately sequential. So we don't cover the eyes so they can see, of course. Uh, now, the, post of the, the most critical time for using drops usually for cataract surgeon is immediately after the cataract surgery. They found that the incidence of endophthalmitis drops significantly if you use the drops immediately after the cataract surgery. So we tend as doctors to patch the eye, ask them to come the next day, the eye is covered and it is a, a very good medium for the infection to flourish. And it is usually very delayed to start the antibiotics. So what I usually say, you take your uh, eye shield and you start using the drops immediately when you, are, when you leave the hospital or even when you are still at the hospital. So this is another important thing. They recommend that you use the drops immediately after the, the surgery, and it's actually in a, in a high dose. Uh, as any other cataract surgeon, the ISBC surgeons, they are encouraged to review their cases regularly and make sure that everything is fitting well with the international guidelines and standards. And this is, if we consider cataract surgery is um, uh, demanding, this is even higher demand for the surgeon and for the skills and excellence that he should practice. So what are the pros of the doing both eyes at the same time? Some advantages for us, um, same day surgery, it is binocular vision restored. I have seen it and I'm sure you saw it yourself that patients with refractive errors left after the first eye surgery, especially if the second eye is delayed, they struggle the most. So you've done a patient who used to be a myopic patient or higher hyperopic patient, and you didn't actually give him the correction because he cannot, he cannot tolerate the anisometropia. And you leave him with this uh, imbalance between both eyes for four weeks, sometimes more, in other units up to a year, for four months, a delay in listing him for the second eye, and you keep running in vicious circles. So it is the same day recovery for the binocular vision. When it comes to the cost for the hospital, it is less. But we have to take this cautiously because actually in some places it is more expensive. Why? It is, as we mentioned, there's a higher demand for the, uh, the instrument that we use, the, uh, supply, the manufacturer that we use to supply our uh, 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 supplies. So this might be a little bit more cost. But overall, in different units, the cost is less by doing the cataract surgery at the same time. Uh, now, we come to the point that we discussed from the beginning. We are making efficient use of the staff and resources. And we are making efficient use as well for the patient and uh, the, the, their time. Uh, they are leaving work. They have things to do in their life. They have family commitments. They have members coming with them. They leave their work. All this comes to money. So we are making a very efficient use of the staff and the resources. And this actually becomes even more important when you are doing a case under general anesthesia. Your patient is asleep. You are taking a risk of general anesthesia. And instead of taking it twice, you are taking it once and you are minimizing the cost of putting him into anesthesia again. The satisfaction of the patient, if it, it went successfully, is higher, of course. Now, as we mentioned in the first slide, maybe you, they, they studied the risk of something goes. Of course, when they looked at this, they looked into catastrophic complication and the non-catastrophic complication. So the catastrophic complication, as we know it as the, as the 
ophthalmologist, of course, it is endophthalmitis. Uh, having endophthalmitis in both eyes in the same day will not be a nice thing to have as a surgeon. But you, the risk, uh, they studied the risk of someone getting another trip to the, uh, to the hospital. And they were speaking, by the way, about the UK with a very low car accident rate. The risk of him being hit in a road accident is 1.5 to 2 times higher being killed in a road accident compared to her running into complication. By the way, in Finland, they didn't record a single case of endophthalmitis happened in this patient. In other places, the risk is 1 in 14,000 that you run into a complication. And mind you, we are not speaking about both eyes having endophthalmitis. And mind you that we are not speaking that endophthalmitis now as a blinding disease, but as, as a blinding problem. We still can treat uh, endophthalmitis and about one third of the cases only will go with uh, a severe visual impairment or blindness. So there is a still a, a chance that even if the very, very, very unlikely situation that you run into endophthalmitis, it can be treated and it will not be both eyes. So... Overall, the risk is not as we think. If I give someone a risk of 1 in 14,000, this is a very, very low risk. If you look at this risk, this is something really low. If you take a flight, I'm sure your risk of getting a, 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 something like, hopefully nothing will happen. But of course, if you discuss risks with people, risk is, uh, we, we look at this, of course, as, 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 as a person, and we exaggerate the problem. But in an actual world, you can neglect this risk because it is very, very low. It's one in 14,000. Of course, if you follow the guidelines. They did actually look at the, um, when I was uh, preparing, they looked at the number of cases reported of having endophthalmitis in both eyes. And by the way, we have four cases reported worldwide. And I think most of them are in India. And unfortunately, if you look at these cases, the four of them had the same instruments, same even... Uh, uh, some patients have same gloves, same viscoelastic used in both eyes. So you cannot blame uh, the actual surgery for something like this to happen. It's actually our failure to follow the guidelines. So what are the disadvantages of having the surgery? As we already discussed, there is a big serious catastrophic events that we are scared about all the time. The never events that we discussed, a wrong IOL, a, ro a wrong planning for the uh, site of the, uh, the, uh, the, the axis of the uh, correction for the um, astigmatism. A never event, an IOL which is, uh, uh, will not uh, propose to be for this eye, it goes to the second eye. And as my colleagues just mentioned now, we don't have the time to optimize the outcome between both eyes. So uh, he just mentioned, I won't have the time for the patient to recover, so I know what is the actual refraction, so I go to the other eye. Again, there's something again this in, in the debate that usually happens. You, in most of the cases that we do, the regular cases that will be done with immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery, your uh, um, uh, precision to get an expected outcome is very, very high. So in other words, an average eye axial lens, an average eye with no complication, no other risk factors, this likelihood is minimal. So it's still... It is not a big valid concern that you need time between eyes. Actually, the recovery time with both eyes open at the same time is better than just going through this twice. But there's a big, big concern, of course, as we just mentioned, uh, logistics. And this might be, we are trying to do this to improve the efficiency, not to make it worse. So we are looking into this as an option in the future to increase efficiency of the service. So if you find that your unit is not equipped to deal with very big demand of manufacturing and stocking of supplies with different manufacturers and different batch numbers, then this is not for you for sure. Because the, the value of this is actually to increase the number, to increase the output and make your service more efficient. So that it might be a counter uh, effect. We don't need this. So if it logistics too much, there is no point of going through this. And the last thing is that, uh, is that this surgery is, of course, by default, goes to the elite surgeons. So that's what they say as, as, a, as a precaution we, when we look at the results, that if you are a surgeon who is taking bilateral cataract surgeries on the same day, you are a very confident surgeon. Most likely you are the best in your region or best in your country, and you are doing it 
So the results that we have right now is actually a reflection of the degree of the operating surgeon. So what if we move to the average surgeon? Will we encounter more complications? We don't know yet, but this is something of concern that we need to look at when we discuss immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery. So I'm, I'm coming now to the conclusion of what we discussed today. Um, we actually faced an unprecedented increase in the demand and the shortage in trained personnel, ophthalmologists. So um, we are encouraged as a group of practitioners to practice risk stratification. If there's one thing you need to practice in every day when you counsel your patient is to stratify your risk and see where your, uh, where your uh, risks lie and plan your game ahead of the day and then you are on top of it and most likely you will not encounter it. And keep doing it every time without any failing and without being complacent about doing it, even if you get more trained. Uh, what I've seen, even for if you consider what you call average surgeon, average surgeon doing risk stratification and following the precautions regularly is more successful than a very senior surgeon complacent and he's overconfident running into complication. And I've seen it more recently and it's happening all the time. A risk stratification with planning the game is really important step to increase your efficiency and to deliver more cases safely. Um, as we mentioned, it improves your outcome and it makes more important efficient use of your service and your time. It is a very precious time. Um, I, ISPC, the immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery, can be the future for the service provided. We should be aware of the concept because I know it might be uh, strange now, but by the time we have the cataract surgery as patients, it might be offered to us. So we have to be prepared for it. It might be the default by the time. They don't have time for us to go for another day. It is your chance whether you take it or leave it. So we have to be prepared for it, at least from the perspective for the national interest and from our country, for our countries. It might be the trend in the future. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.